All right, guys. Um, good late morning. I hope you had a, all had a good break. Um, my name is uh, Asif Khan. I'm the uh, founder and president of the Location-Based Marketing Association. Um, and we're an international uh, trade association with uh, about 1,200 member companies, uh, kind of bringing both the brand side and, and the, uh, the vendor side together and kind of facilitating a lot of education and research around the use of location technology and data. I'll let uh, Jared introduce himself. Yeah, I'm uh, Jared Hand. Uh, I work for Foursquare. I oversee sales for our attribution and our media business. Uh, for those that are not familiar with Foursquare, uh, we are a location intelligence company. We started about 10 years ago uh, on the consumer bit, consumer side, developing uh, apps, namely Foursquare and now Swarm, uh, to help enhance people's real world experiences by tapping into their location and, and providing suggestions, recommendations, and a, a social capability to uh, share their whereabouts and all their experiences. We now use that same data and technology to actually power a number of different uh, B2B solutions, media, attribution, uh, and then also some enterprise solutions through our API and our SDK. Yeah, very cool. Uh, my name is Cameron Peebles. I'm Chief Marketing Officer for InMarket. Uh, we are a consumer engagement platform, both media and insights. We're integrated in around 50 million uh, devices in the U.S. Um, and we're fairly unique we, with our integrations with around 1,000 apps. We have always on location data for our users, help our brands to map out how consumers are engaging with the physical world but then also launch campaigns, both programmatically and through those apps, to, to power relevant communication to users at the, at the moments that matter, at the moment of decisions. Yeah, my name is Andy Elwood, and I'm founder and uh, president of Basket. Uh, Basket is a smart shopping list that allows people to understand uh, when they go grocery shopping, which stores around them carry all the products on their list for the week, and the total price at each store for everything that's on their list, uh, providing pricing transparency in the offline world, uh, but also allowing that attribution to flow from intent while they're standing in their kitchen and their pantry, all the way to the, the aisle and uh, checkout. Excellent. All right, so we're gonna, um, I, I think this is the most important panel of the day because we're gonna talk about attribution and why it's important to, uh, to measure, you know, what's going on with all the, the local data that's, uh, that's out there. But before we talk about that, Let's just have a quick discussion about uh, location data quality because it keeps coming up. I've already heard it several times uh, this morning. And uh, you know, from our perspective, you know, uh, every year we put out something called the Global Location Trends Report. Uh, and when we looked at the data there, 72% um, of marketers that we surveyed you know, are, want to use location data, think it's great, or, or trying to leverage it but only 63% of them felt that the available data out there was actually good quality, accurate data. Love to get your perspectives on that, all of you. So maybe start with Andy. It's been, been interesting. Uh, you know, my first startup I ever worked at was Gowalla, which was yeah. launched the exact same day as Foursquare in 2009. And we went head to head like Biggie and Tupac for three years. Uh, and it was, it, was, it, was, it was dependent upon whether you were East Coast or West Coast, which one you downloaded first. And, and so it's been fascinating because at, at that time, the, getting people to turn the location uh, services button on their phone was part of our onboarding challenge. Um, now location is ubiquitous and it, almost nobody has any, a problem with uh, sharing their location as long as there's a good understanding of what they get in, in response. And I feel like that's the, been the really interesting part about the evolution of, of location. Um, this is my fourth time coming to Street Fight because uh, after Gowalla, I worked with a company called Waze um, and was, was, had the great opportunity to open up their New York office and help build out that team as well. And so now with Basket, it's kind of fun to kind of see the continued evolution of location being the underlying principle and the underlying uh, data asset that we're working on, but coming up with ways to make it more personal and, and more relevant um, all the time as opposed to just uh, kind of uh, jump through these three hoops and then if you're standing in the right spot, you'll get a prize. Uh, but actually, useful is something that, that I think is a really interesting uh, next of the evolution for all of us. Right. Yeah, as the, uh, I guess, biggie in this example. Are you the Tupac then? I, I guess he's the, based on coasts. We, we, we got acquired by Facebook, which is the same thing as Tupac getting taken you know, down in Vegas. You know, they brought him back in, in uh, uh, augmented Hologram reality, form. Yes. holographic Hologram form, form, so, you know, maybe you guys, you know, can be reborn again. Oh, that Good. would be scary. Um, I, look, I, I think it certainly is a problem. Um, I think that the location space is actually more vital to more businesses today, so there's a greater reliance on it, which means that the problems that do exist in it are more pronounced today. 
Um, what, what I really think it comes down to, though, is kind of understanding when we're talking about the issues with data, is it an issue in the fact that the data is just bad, in which cases that's true, in some cases that's true, because you've got fraudulent data that's moving through the exchanges. But I, I think the bigger issue is that good data is oftentimes used for the wrong use case. And so, you know, you can get uh, location data off of the bid stream in the form of lat long. You can get uh, location data through a consumer app or through an SDK, which I know we all do to some extent, and you're getting a much more robust set of data signals, and that can apply to a much different set of use cases. And so I, I think the bigger issue is educating the market to understand what types of location data are available and what the use cases are for each of those types of data. Um, and as long as you're applying good data and the right data to the right use cases, you can have fantastic results. And so it's, it's really kind of incumbent on all of us and yourself and the overall industry to educate marketers, to educate agencies, and help them understand kind of really the nuances of the space so that they can figure out what they need to be looking for, what questions they need to be asking, and how they need to be using data for the, for the objectives that they have. Thank yeah, I, I, I think that, you know, this is a continuation of the narrative that's been going on for, you know, as long as brands have, have reached out to agencies, have reached out to vendors, is brands say, I want you to prove the improvable and make sure th that uh, I, I know that what we're doing is being successful. Agencies come down to vendors and say, you know, we want to get to the end goal of, of our, what our brands want. So location in itself is not an end. It's a, it's a means to it, and there's many levers to, to be pulled in it. What we really want is to prove effectiveness and to prove knowledge of consumers. And consumers vote with their feet in the physical world. So location is one element to that that can be layered in. And, and in, in addition to that, consumers don't live their lives in points. They live their lives in patterns. So through that, we can, we can educate ourselves and build tools through this constant narrative that helps answer the unanswerable questions that were previously unanswerable, and then there will come another layer on top of that. So we, we really view this as, as attribution as not being an end because it will never end. It's a continuous loop both in the evolution of what attribution means, what media means, but even on a micro scale, what it means to say an individual campaign, right? You, we, we want to prove and say you gave us this amount of money and we gave you two or three times passed on that. But in addition to that, the other benefits we bring are knowledge about your business and about your consumer base. That was implemented and proven throughout an individual campaign, made it that much more effective. Then we build trust within the, the agency or brand you know, from that, that execution, from those learnings, and hopefully they can, you know, that brings them back to us as vendors, but helps them to evolve their business in, in a further way. Um, one of the things that we talk about a lot at the LBMA is we have this model that we call the three-layer location cake. And so if you think about a three-layer cake, uh, and you think about the bottom of the cake being about driving traffic to the store, to the location, right? So, you know, whether that's using geofencing strategies or social platforms or platforms like Foursquare or, you know, uh, local search optimization or whatever it is, you know, you got to get the traffic there in the first place. And then once they're there, you know, the second layer of the cake for us is this idea of, okay, we've got them here, how do we increase basket, dwell time, customer service, engagement, all the sort of micro location stuff, beacons, Wi-Fi, you know, smart lighting, smart flooring, all that stuff becomes really interesting, right? Um, but the problem is, is a lot, of, a lot of the retailers, we work with a ton of retailers and brands, and a lot of them kind of stopped the, the location discussion there. They didn't kind of go to the next level of, you know, how do we tie that then to, you know, the point of sale system, the loyalty system, the purchase data. So kind of bringing this panel back to, at, when we talk about attribution now, you know, the industry from a location perspective has been focused on geo-targeted ad, did the ad result in traffic, and it kind of stops there because th that's as far as they can go, right? Um, so would love, Jared, to kind of get your view on, you know, how are some of your customers using the data to, to drive traffic there and what, what kind of makes sense today and how, how do you actually help them measure the effectiveness of it? Yeah. Um, so to take your metaphor of the three-level cake, I mean, I think, look, you're, you're right. Media is a big part of the kind of driving people into store. Um, what we're doing is we're looking at people and the location signals that we get for really kind of two applications when it comes to media. The first would certainly be kind of is somebody 
you know, within proximity to a specific location and does that create an opportunity to affect their behaviors and ultimately get them to take those extra steps into a store? And then obviously you look at dwell time and you, know, and, and you try to determine um, did that person have intent in their visit? Was it an actual real visit? And then ultimately um, you, know, you look at that at scale to, to determine the overall effectiveness of a campaign. W what I think is really interesting though is the kind of other side of the use case from a media and from a measurement perspective, which is to kind of take a step back and not look at somebody at a point in time, but look at the kind of the whole of all of their behaviors over time to understand a lot about their lifestyle and uh, you know their socioeconomic attributes and their tastes, their interests, and their patterns, uh, as Cameron mentioned, and ultimately be able to, number one, start to predict who's going to behave in the way that you ultimately desire based on things they've done in the past and things that they do on a repeated basis and ultimately make sure that you're messaging to the right people, but then also to study that all the way through to the visit to the store, the time spent in store. And then if you're really fortunate, you bring in data that actually is at the transaction level and you can put all of that together to start to really understand some really of the audience. And that, then that should kind of move further upstream and start to inform your everything from your planning to the products that you put on the shelves to your overall messaging and in-store experience strategy to the way that you price those products even potentially to where you open your next store so starting to understand the transaction beyond just hey is somebody near our store can we drive them in but really kind of build a longer term view of them and a longer term relationship that's how i think you're going to do things like get them to the store more frequently increase their ba basket size, get them to spend more money, and be able to measure all of that because you understand their real needs and their interests and you can start to cater the, to those in a much more profound way. Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned this idea of, you know, kind of like this holistic view of the data, right, and what you can do with it. And, and, you, and you mentioned, you know, where you might open the next door. I mean, what's interesting for me as, as, as the Global Industry Association, you know, we, we represent the full spectrum of companies, right, including guys on the sort of old world of location, the location intelligence guys like Esri and you know, companies like yep. that, which their whole business historically is about where should we build that next door, yep. right? And how do we do site selection and how do we do those things using location data? And, it, and what's interesting to me is to see how companies like Foursquare and others, you know, that are coming at it sort of from this new world of location are starting to kind of kind of come in the middle, right? And find, find ways to, to link up. I want to sh shift to, to Andy for a second. So when I think about Basket and the kind of platform that you guys, you know, are bringing to market, it, it's really sort of, you know, while it's not directly transactional data, it's a bit of a proxy for, for purchase, right? How do you see that sort of feeding into helping brands understand the, the attribution model better around the sort of, the, you know, what they're doing with driving the traffic in? Yeah, when we think about uh, it's, it's a pleasure to have on the stage my friend Kurt Drake, who works for it. And therefore, I now have lads that attribute or follow, follow me around next with social, where I like the brand, I retweet the brand, I, you know, I favorite it. Um, but now we actually have, you know, with our smart shopping list, we've got over a million unique SKUs in grocery and everyday products that people are adding to their shopping list. And what we found is when people start to toggle or update or uh, augment their shopping list, they're going to the store with intent. Iteration window that they would like to just kind of add something to their interaction. Maybe that's not the best way to uh, learn that they uh, maybe suggest products that they might want to consider. We can actually see based on the day of the week and how many mail are they going to the store that's close to five o'clock to see if they're going to get flat, uh, mm -hmm. or are they going for price point? Uh, a little bit further to stay in line with everybody. Uh, on average, we're giving people the up to 30% on their grocery list, um, and for a lot of folks, a significant amount. Uh, yeah, Mike, switch, switch up the mic there. Um, so, so it's given us the ability to to bring that value to the shopper, and. In exchange for that, they're actually giving us the attribution that when they're in the store, they've got their shopping list open. Uh, we organize the shopping list based on what aisle we think the products are going to be on. They're actually checking items off the list as they're putting them into the basket. Um, we do an audit uh, of about 10% of our shopping lists where we say, if you take a picture of your receipt, we'll send you a gift card um, for a portion of that purchase just to make sure that we're actually aligning the attribution of this is what they actually purchased with what they said they purchased. Um, there are those impulse buys that they're not going to go back and add to their shopping list. So we're, you know, we're, but we're over 85% of what they're checking off their list is what we're seeing on their receipts. Thank you. Cameron, so when, when, when I look at your guys' platform and kind of how you've evolved from kind of being the beacon guys to 
uh, where you are today. I mean, it, it, it's, it's like a complete dramatic shift in, in the business model in a lot of ways. And, and so you've got your SDK sitting in hundreds of apps out there collecting a lot, 100% first party data, I believe, right? Correct. 100%. Correct. Um, and, um, you, you know, we're hearing, I, I've heard now twice now, predicting, predicting, right? And how we use this data to predict. And so it, you guys have been doing a lot of work lately in, in kind of predicting, you know, where some of these retailers and some of these brands are going, right? Toys R Us closing stores, things like that. How are you able to kind of look at that, um, you know, at a audience segmentation perspective? Uh, you know, and where do you see that going in terms of taking that down to the individual, you know, transactional layer? So, I mean, we've talked about how uh, consumers' patterns through the world build, build uh, patterns as to where they're likely to go, but um, just stopping there and you're thinking about attribution or the conversation that a brand or uh, product is building with a consumer is like finding the best place for that store, but then not hiring a good designer inside to, to really optimize what's happening in there. Um, so, you know, along those, we get to do a lot of both macro and macro, uh, micro things with our data, and in marketing, I get to, to lead a lot of those. So, to your point, we, we, uh, we, we score, give loyalty scores out there uh, to retailers of different sizes based on always on data. And uh, we found that loyalty is actually one of the biggest predictors for, for retail business health. So, as you mentioned before, we had, I believe back in June, uh, put out a loyalty report and Toys R Us and, uh, and Nine West scored at the lowest of our loyalty reports. And they've just recently come out with their bankruptcy announcements and store closures. So, um, it's definitely becoming a barometer for health within in an industry, both are they going, i.e. voting, and are they repeatedly voting with their feet and tangentially dollars. But even more than that, you know, um, we through you know our direct integrations with these apps, where we get our first-party data, um, are actually able to message. And, and as our CEO would say, if you could whisper into the ear of a consumer at the exact right moment, uh, what would you say? And so a lot of people don't know us because we're the platform behind apps like Epicurious or you know Condé Nast or WebMD that are waking up and actually messaging people and 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 making recommendations for products within the store from sources that are known and trusted to the consumer. And we look at that as, okay, that's step then two of an overall conversation. And we, we work in kind of, in a way, specialized in emerging brands. And, um, and it's great to see that what a conversation between an emerging brand can do in, in very much a David and Goliath way. Uh, for instance, we, we do a lot of mapping for campaign effectiveness windows. And this would be, nobody's ever heard of you, we have to do this place this amount of media in order for people to a know that you exist, but then put you put you on their radar, and then go and actually pick up a product, and to try it out for yourself or for your family. And along with our brands and agencies, we're actually able to see even quantitatively prove um, the exact right amount of messaging, the right exact right type of messaging that's most effective. Uh, for being a value to consumers and them saying, wow, I have heard about this. One big uh, piece of note was, a uh, uh, brand of note was Proyo ice cream, which is a low fat ice cream for people who work out a lot. And as a guy in his 40s who works out a lot, I thank them for allowing me to eat ice cream again. But uh, they were taking on some very large brands and, and over the course were able to reduce their campaign effectiveness window or the time when media starts to when they see the bump by 3.7 times within three months. And that's just an example of using attribution to improve media in a cyclical fashion can make aver move advertising from something because everybody hates advertising and but they want things for free and everybody but everybody wants offers and they want recommendations. So as much as we can do as a community and as a group uh, of vendors and strategists to enable that that next evolution, um, you know that's going to raise all tides within the industry. So. so you mentioned offers and, and, and things like that. How, how do you guys see the balance kind of emerging between, you know, giving people what they want, like using the data and, and understanding what they purchase and, you know, having them find the deals and the things on the things that they already buy and, and want, and finding that balance between sort of discovery of new things, like the serendipitous aspect of it, versus, you know, here's the stuff that, you know, you already use and you know and you want and you've defined your, your profile and you said this is what, you know, I want to be messaged about this brand. You know, how do you, how do you, how do you use the data in today's world 
you know, to kind of manage that balance between discovery and, and, and intent. Well, I think it's important, and you know, it's one of the reasons for, for our success that you know, the advertising as a whole is becoming very commoditized with the programmatic ecosystem. And that is, is in a lot of ways, it enables scalability, it enables you know, la large scale volumes of, of outreach in, in a very short amount of time. But one thing that, that we found is, is doing things within a closed loop and, doing, and working with our brands from a consultative point of view, we're able to find and understand that, that, that sweet spot of messaging from a frequency, from a strategy point of view. And um, a lot of it is, you know, having done this for eight plus years, a lot of it is simple control exposed testing, you know? And a lot of it, we, we always say we're, we're just using strategies that have been around and proven in the digital world, in the physical world. So an example, you know, everybody shops on Amazon and then you see that thing that you didn't buy, you're retargeted for it, we, we all know this. Um, but being able to understand people's, what people should and would be interested in, being able to measure them and just be a constant reminder that, that this is available and then give them incentives or nudges to, to move in the, in the direction. Um, we can do some really amazing testing on that and, and, it's, um, and these strategies are, even though we're working in you know, the stratosphere of, of ad tech, strategies are very well established uh, as to how to, to test and prove these methodologies with, with the new technology that we have. Awesome. Jared, I want to talk a little bit about um, cross-device attribution. Um, you know, it keeps coming up lately, you know, m some of the uh, mobile operators, the carriers have tried to link, you know, what people are doing online to what they're doing on their phones. Are you guys seeing, you know, desire for your data sets to, to kind of help in that discussion at all? Um, and I guess part of it too is, is that, you know, for us at, at the industry level, you know, there's a, there seems to be a big, you know, movement uh, or brands anyways wanting to do what we call physical retargeting. So using data from the bricks and mortar world, you know, by bumping into sensors and, and you know, beacons and things like that and storing that data to then affect ad retargeting online, you know, when you're in, in Facebook or whatever at home. Yeah. Um, how are you guys seeing that cross device piece? Yeah, so again, I think there's kind of two parts to that. There's the audience targeting and segmentation piece of it, and then there's the measurement across all of those different channels and all those different devices. You know, what we have that's unique and special, much like uh, in Marketing Cameron is, we've got, you know, a, a mountain of first party data, and we've got millions of people that have our technology sitting on their devices. So what we bring to the table is that we really understand, deterministically actually, where people go throughout their day. We've got always on location enabled within our, within our apps. We've got an SDK where we work with other third party apps where we have you know, always on location enabled. And we have our own unique proprietary map of the world as defined by all the location signals associated with the place. So those two things together allow us to really understand with precision and, and, and the most high degree of accuracy, specifically where people go, even in densely populated urban areas. So th with that as a baseline, what, what marketers and agencies ultimately want to do is they want to either onboard that data into, um, you know, targeting on mobile, targeting on desktop, targeting on connected television, anywhere that you can ultimately leverage that audience and reach those people based on the definition of who they are and what their interests are because of the places that they go in the world time and again. Um, that kind of like is how we play into the audience targeting across devices is ultimately make data available largely on a management basis, but we can also do it on a, but we can also do it on a, um, you know, by providing the data out to, you know, other environments so that they can actually reach those audiences leveraging our data. From a measurement perspective, then it's really just about being able to capture all of that exposure data across all those different environments. So we're measuring mobile, in-app, mobile web, we're measuring desktop, we're measuring uh, connected TV, we're measuring search, we're measuring social, um, we're moving into the linear TV space, out of home is a very big ask, streaming audio, uh, soon to be uh, in, in the uh, terrestrial radio space. So being able to understand and capture unique IDs for people that were exposed across all those environments, and then ultimately mapping it back to our first party audience so that we can understand post exposure where did they go and what did they do? And so that's really what we're bringing to the party for a kind of cross device targeting and measurement. It all kind of starts with our first party data set and then leveraging that in both of those different ways so that, so that marketers can ultimately understand how effectively they're reaching their audience and, and how effectively they're motivating that audience to do certain things. So um, I, I want to bring it back to Andy for, for, for one second here. So 
that's really interesting what you just described in terms of linking it across the different media types. If you have truly have sort of proxy for purchase data and you understand the intent uh, based on the on looking at it historically, how do you how do you guys see that balance between driving traffic then to bricks and mortar environment where people can actually buy those things versus the online or do you care? Um, and, and like potentially, and I'm just throwing this completely off the top of my head right now, but um, like where would you see sort of the, like virtualization of something like Amazon Dash, um, you know, playing into what you do? A yeah, really interesting question. We've been, uh, my pet project, still not built, is the smart trash can. <laughs> that when I'm done with something, I scan the barcode as it goes into my trash can and now it's on my shopping list. And the, the really interesting part about the data that we've been pulling over the past four and a half years, we've got about 16 billion historical prices now across 170,000 grocery stores in the US. Uh, we just added in Q4 online grocery prices to our database. And so now if you don't have time to go to the store yourself and you just want to hit order, we're making that possible. Uh, we're also showing you the premium you're paying to do so. Um, and so what we've found is there's about a 35 to 40 percent savings by just going to your local store over purchasing online with Instacart, Postmates, Amazon, any of the online uh, grocery retailers. Um, and a lot of that, ha that number has gone up significantly since Walmart's purchase of Jet. Jet was the lower bounds of online grocery prices. And once Walmart bought them and then put them as the premium option, uh, and tried to make Walmart.com the best place to buy at low price. The entire online grocery market has gone up as far as pricing is concerned, but nobody knows. And so uh, for Basket, we're Switzerland. I don't care where you finish or complete that purchase. That's not what our business is. We're giving you the information to make that decision based on what's important to you, based on time of day and things along those lines. That being said, we'll be more than happy to take a referral fee when we start to really put that at scale um, and start to point people in that direction, a la kayak for travel, um, think about things along those lines. So, so for us, we, we are not incentivized to push anyone's specific retail solution, uh, ex but we're merely exposing that data. And what we found is, is, is you know, uh, evenings on weekdays, people are going to the store that's most convenient to them. Uh, Saturdays and Sundays, people are driving a little bit further to save a little bit more. Um, they're doing their stock up trip on the weekend when they have a little bit more time. Uh, and on a two or three hundred dollar you know, stock up trip, that's 60 or 70 or maybe 80 bucks that they're saving because they checked with us first. Put that in their pocket and then they're spending on other things. Um, you know, we had, we had, my favorite story is a, a woman who was saving two or three hundred bucks a month using Basket. And uh, in 2016, uh, she just put it all into Bitcoin. She feels great about her experience with Basket now. Um, so, uh, it's, you know, for us, for us, we, we want to trust the consumer to make the best decision for them. And as a result, the data exhaust that we're getting, both on the business intelligence side of things, we understand the inventory and pricing of all the CPG products that are out there at all these different stores. Uh, that's really interesting. So we have an entire solution that's happening there. But then also owning and understanding consumer intent uh, is something that we're, we're, we're putting a lot, of, a lot of our resources into. Awesome. Cameron, I'll give you the last word. Minute and a half, intent. Intent. Yes, consumer intent. Uh, you know, based on this data, you guys have a lot. You know, a lot of data that's sitting there across. You know, all these different apps. Um, you know, if there's one piece of data that you don't have today, what is it that you want? Interesting. Um, you know, obviously we want to read people's minds, but we can. But we have a beta program out for that, so yeah. coming in the fall. Um, I think the, the biggest thing we, we get from, from clients is, is, uh, is quantifying inaccuracy of, of everything that, that we're doing. And I think it, it again goes back to that conversation of brands always challenging. That's their job, right? They're at their core allocating marketing dollars and marketing spend. So um, it, it, it keeps us on our toes, keeps us innovating, keeps you know, doing more innovative and, and cooler things with, you know, at the end, we've just got phones in our pockets, right? But it's the behind the scenes working on, on that that's increasing both the stories that we're able to tell to consumers, the, um, the narrative that we're able to bring back to our brands, and then the uh, authoritative nature that we prove that what we're all doing here is something that helps to, to move their business forward. Because we all know this, 
does work. That reaching out digitally is the new norm and, and in the swipe first modern generation, that is how consumers expect and demand their brands to reach out to them. Proving the strategies and making sure that it's not white noise or that it's not something that is annoying and, and, and really turning that broadsword into a scalpel is the reason for everything that we're doing up here. Um, so I think that's the next thing is that provability element um, that we can continue to earn the trust in dollars for the brands. Thanks. We're out of time. If you would, help me thank this, uh, this great panel.